I'm George Smart from the U.S. Marnus Radio Breaking News Desk, which I'm sitting at right now. In Palm Springs, one of the largest concentrations of modernist houses in the world, a downtown hotel association wants to buy a huge statue of Marilyn Monroe for $1 million to increase tourism post-pandemic. The statue is a fun but somewhat cheesy 26-foot-tall depiction of the famous scene where Marilyn's dress blows up over a grate. She was going to go right downtown where all the tourists could gawk and take photos, but there's a problem. Last fall, the city council suddenly voted to close the street and place the statue right in front of the world-class Palm Springs Art Museum, creating widespread resistance and a legal challenge. Let's go now to past podcast guest and international designer and Palm Springs resident Trina Turk, who with noted preservationist Chris Minrad has raised over $56,000 on GoFundMe because, hey, these legal fights ain't cheap. Hi, Trina. Hi, George. Tell me about this statue of Marilyn Monroe. Well, Marilyn is 26 feet tall, and she weighs 34,300 pounds. And she is a sculpture that is basically a rendering of the scene in The Seven-Year Itch, where Marilyn Monroe is standing over a subway grate, and her skirt of her white dress is blowing up. The famous so photo, this, right, yeah. Yeah, a famous photo has been interpreted into a giant statue. And just to get kind of the idea of how large she is, if you're standing next to her, you might go up to, I would say, slightly above her ankle or her calf. Oh, okay. Because she's so huge that, you know, she's wearing a, a small heel. So if you stand next to her, you know, you are dwarfed by her. She is humongous. And she's been around, what, about 10 years, roughly? Well, she was in Palm Springs from 2012 to 2014. I believe she was made in the 90s. And she's been in Chicago. And I think she's been in New Jersey. And I guess the difference between when she was in Chicago, for example, is that in Chicago, she was surrounded by skyscrapers. So her scale wasn't quite as, I guess I would say, jarring as it is in Palm Springs, where really the tallest building is maybe, you know, eight or nine stories tall. Sure. Now, people really love the Maryland statue as a, a tourist attraction. And it was a big hit when it came to Palm Springs before. And what caused it to come back? Well, there's a hotel organization called PS Resorts. And the president or CEO, his name is Aftop Dada, loves Maryland and really believes in Maryland almost as a antidote to the what has happened with the pandemic. You know, business has been down naturally because travel has been down across the country. Sure. But anyway, he loves her and he views her as something to sort of solve all Palm Springs problems and bring flocks of people to Palm Springs. Which is not a bad idea in theory, right? Because there has been a pandemic and tourism is down. And, yes. And there was a plan to have all this roll out. What was the plan? Well, the plan was that there's some redevelopment going on in downtown Palm Springs. And in 2016, there was a plan done for the area that's being redeveloped be called the Downtown Palm Springs Specific Plan. And in that plan, there's a park designed. And Maryland was to have a place in the park. Uh, you know, this is something that was worked on for many, many years with various community groups, architects, you know, all the, all the interested parties. It was sort of hashed out over several years. And in 2016, this plan was finalized with Marilyn placed in the park. And, you know, she is a big, like, tourists do like Marilyn. They like to get her picture taken with Marilyn. So anyhow, this was kind of like the plan. And then in November, the plan was changed. November last year. Yes, November 2020. Basically, out of nowhere, the Palm Springs City Council and PS Resorts announced that they were closing a street called Museum Way. And in the plan from 2016, Museum Way was a new street that was designed to connect 
the Palm Springs Art Museum to the main drag of Palm Springs, which is called Palm Canyon Drive. It's a really beautiful mid-century building. And the museum way was to provide a sight line from Palm Canyon Drive to the museum. And then the, the mountains are behind. So it's sort of a really beautiful view from Palm Canyon. Absolutely. Sure. So the new plan that the city council and PS Resorts came up with in November was to place the giant Maryland statue right in the middle of Museum Way, which is the new street that the taxpayers paid for, blocking the front of the museum. So this is controversial, <laughs> and the organization that I'm representing called CREMA, the Committee to Relocate Maryland, is basically trying to convince the city council to move her back to her location in the park or to find another location, but not to block the front of this iconic museum that's actually on the National Register of Historic Places. So if you're listening to this and thinking, well, you know, Palm Springs is big, it's a desert. What's the problem with putting a 26 foot tall Maryland in front of a museum? Um, what would people see when they exit the museum? Well, what they would see is Maryland's skirt blowing up and they basically would get, you know, a, a butt shot <laughs> and her giant granny panties. <laughs> and if you'd like to see a rendering of that, you can visit our GoFundMe page where we have a rendering of what that would look like. I mean, it's not it's photoshopped, but right. you get the idea. Right. And that's not really appropriate for a world class art museum. No, it's not. And it's it's really not appropriate for uh, a world class art museum or really for, you know, a city that has kind of like made its name on mid-century architecture to place this thing in front of such an important building. Yeah. So if if they would just put it back where they were supposed to put it, everything would be hunky dory. Everything would be hunky dory as far as we're concerned. Yes. OK. So your CREMA group has raised an amazing amount of money. Yes. What is your strategy with the council now? How are you going to approach getting them to make this right? Well, we have an attorney who's actually been working with us since January, and she's written a couple of letters, and the responses we've gotten from the city have not been satisfactory. So um, I am not able to discuss exactly what the next thing is. Okay. But um, Or you'd have to kill purpose, me. Yes, I know. Okay. <laughs> the whole purpose of the GoFundMe is to finance any legal action that might be necessary. And we do anticipate that some will be necessary because just sort of general commentary from the citizens of Palm Springs has been ignored by the city council. And they've also, frankly, contradicted this 2016 downtown plan that was, as I said, you know, sort of worked out over many years with many entities involved. So the idea that our city council is kind of just pretending like that never happened is quite disturbing and kind of begs the question, why are they doing the bidding of PS Resorts and letting them co-opt this new taxpayer funded street? It's a bit of a mystery. We don't know why they're doing it, but it doesn't seem quite right. Now, how can people contribute to this, Trina? Well, they can go to GoFundMe. And the fundraiser is under CREMA, which is C-R-E-M-A, the Committee to Relocate Maryland. Or they can just search my name, Trina Turk, and it will pop up that way as well. Okay. And you can see the pictures. You can read the whole blurb that we have about what our organization is trying to do. And we also have on the GoFundMe page a few letters that have gone back and forth from the city council to our attorney. And we also posted the city council meeting where they abruptly announced this decision that they were going to move the placement of Maryland, which was just really strange. And I don't know if the whole, well, anyway, you can watch it. There's, we just posted the YouTube of the city council meeting and it's just really strange because it really came out of nowhere. Nobody knew about it except for the city council and PS resorts, which is the entity that bought the statue. Okay. How does a group just go buy a statue? Do they pay cash for it or how do they do it? 
Well, we know that it costs a million dollars. And there is some language in the contract between the Palm Springs City Council and PS Resorts that leads us to believe that they took out a loan for the statue. Yeah. Um, but I'm not positive of that. Maybe they bought her outright. But it there's just some references to, you know, certain dates starting contingent upon whenever they get the loan. Okay. So, so, so yeah. So there's a bank involved in this somewhere. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, I have to ask, because you're a famous designer, is there going to be a cream of line of products that we can buy to support <laughs> this effort? Like, you know, well, some cream of T-shirts or anything? <laughs> I don't know that we have the timeline <laughs> To actually make product. Right now, we're working on just kind of rallying community support. Okay. Getting people to become aware of the whole situation through the GoFundMe page. We're trying to get citizens in Palm Springs to write to the city council and write to the Desert Sun, which is our local newspaper. So um, I'm hoping that it will be resolved and she will go back to her original planned place prior to us having to make t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> well, Trina, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for updating us on this emerging situation. Okay. Thank you, George. And now we return to our regular program. Hi, I'm Lady Carnarvon. I live at Highclere Castle, which I think many of you know as Danton Abbey. And thank you for listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow Gonna draw my modern anyhow Mama don't allow no architecture around here Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio Where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate Modernist architecture The most exciting and controversial buildings in the world Remember our friends, the classicists, the guys who want to ban modernist buildings? Well, whenever they want to troll modernism, they claim it was communist, and therefore anything any communist ever did or built must be no good for the old U.S. of A. Since we've never known any building to determine economic policy, joining us are two people who dive deep into this uh, concrete issue. Haruna Hunkop director of Built to Last, Relics of Communist-Era Architecture, and Marie Kordovska, granddaughter of Vera and Vladimir Mekonin's late modern architects from Czechoslovakia. Later on, we'll welcome another one of our special musical guests, Haley Tuck, and now aspiring to be a finalist on the History Channel's long-running Alone series, here's your host, George Smart. Thank you, Tom. Have you seen Alone on the History Channel? Here's the premise of this show. Contestants are dropped off in separate sections of a remote area, like Patagonia or northern Mongolia, far enough apart to ensure they will not contact each other. They only get to take 10 items of survival gear plus clothing and some GoPro-type cameras to document their daily activities. The contestants must find food, build shelters, and endure deep isolation, the lack of food, and psychological stress until there is only one person left. Not that the others die— they just call for a rescue with a sat phone. Get to the chopper! <laughs> From the movie Predator, that's Tom Guild as Arnold Schwarzenegger. Thank you. Thank you. The winner in Alone, like most reality shows, is the last one to remain. And they get a huge pile of cash. Most recently, $1 million. Contestants are warned that the show might last for up to a year. It's a commitment. Wow. And I've been thinking about entering. And who needs 10 items? Please. I can make it with five. After they drop me on the island or the desert or wherever, I'll set up a butterfly chair, item one, martini glass, item two, vodka, item three, <laughs> orange juice, item four, and lastly, a camera. 30 minutes should do it, just enough time to take a few photos, and I'm out. It's like Kramer's early departure in Seinfeld's famous episode, The Contest, one of the most brilliant <laughs> TV scripts ever filmed, right, which right. is on YouTube. You have to know, for me, that going camping is the Hyatt Regency without HBO. <laughs> and going extreme camping is the Motel 6. Oh, dear. I'm a seasoned survivalist. 
which means I can order pizza with my bare hands if room service is not available. <laughs> so my hat's off to the very brave and resourceful men and women who stay out there on a loan, hunting, fishing, and just trying to stay alive for 60, 100, more days. They know how to endure, how to last, how to combine with nature, just like modernism. Way to go. Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from Wendy Robineau and Don Beskind. And our first guest, Haruna Hunkap, is a Czech-Japanese documentary filmmaker and video artist focusing on architecture and urbanism. Her debut documentary was called Built to Last, Relics of Communist-Era Architecture, which was filmed in 11 post-communist countries in Eastern Europe. She's currently working on the film Olympic Halftime, researching upcoming Olympic cities, Tokyo this year, they hope, Beijing 2022, and Paris 2024, and how those cities are dealing with the Olympic legacy of architecture. Welcome, Haruna. Thank you for your introduction. Hi to everyone. Marie Kardoska is an art theory graduate and co-founder of the nonprofit Respect Madam, promoting respectful treatment of post-war architecture. She's the granddaughter of Vera and Vladimir Marconins, late modern architects from Czechoslovakia, where she works to keep their legacy alive today. She campaigns for better understanding of her grandparents' work and is especially active in saving Hotel Thermal in Karlovy Vary from an unfortunate reconstruction. Welcome, Mari. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Where is Karlovy Vary? It's about an hour and a half to the west from Prague. It's a small spa town. It used to be very popular since the 19th century for spa treatments. Now, Haruna, you told us as we were hooking up here, you're on a boat right now? Yes, I am uh, based on a boat in Prague on the Vltava River and not far from the center. So it's a bit uh, shaky, although there is lo- lots of snow today. So, yeah, here we go. That's that's living uh, the life on a houseboat in Prague. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Are you able to stay warm? Uh, yeah, absolutely. There is a fireplace, so I'm feeding it with wooden briquettes. So, yeah. What every boat needs, a fireplace. Right. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> now, is, is the houseboat your home? Uh, yes, my home and my studio where I edit my films and I do screenings of films and, yeah. It's where I do stuff. Is there a big houseboating community? In I mean, are you in a like a neighborhood of houseboats? Yeah, yeah. There are actually some artists, filmmakers, and just people who love water living around. So I'm definitely not alone here. Now, Marie and Haruna, both of you, I know this is a stupid question, as Europe is a big place. But have the two of you met before? Uh Actually, I know about Marie because Prague is really small city. It's uh, only like one million people living here. I saw her when she had a talk about architecture after a film, The Palace of People, which was screened in Prague the other day, last year. So I met her there, but I don't know if she remembers me. <laughs> Marie? <laughs> I think I've seen Herana's film and we've been actually on several lectures together because not only Prague has only one million people, but people interested in architecture, there's like 70 of them or maybe (laughs) even less. So um, we definitely do know each other, but we haven't had the chance to grab a beer and actually say hi. Well, I hope that you'll do that now that you've had this chat. (laughs) Well, I mean, the the quarantine has to end, but soon enough. Marie, tell us about your grandparents. And I know that you've said in other interviews, you grew up in a mini kotva. What is that? Yes. <laughs> um, that's a very kind of an inside baseball joke that Prague people will understand. But my grandfather, he died in 1990. So I've never actually met him. And my grandmother is still alive when well. Uh, I'm actually going to be seeing her in two days. I'm going to have to tests done to make sure that she's fine and I'm going to see her. They were quite prominent architects in Czechoslovakia during the 60s, which is um, the 60s is a key era in Czechoslovakia history because it was within the communist regime. It was a bit more free 
you might have heard of Prague Spring. Yes, yes. And, 1968. And all of that. Yeah, so up until 1968, the 60s were kind of freer. And my grandparents got the chance to win a lot of architecture competitions at the time, uh, which allowed them to finish the projects throughout the 70s and 80s. And uh, yeah, Kotva is this huge shopping mall in the center of Prague. And as you might know, the center of Prague is quite historic, very Baroque and classical and Gothic and all of that. And my grandparents, they built this late modern structure in the middle of this area. So it's a very well-known building. Mostly people hate it. A lot of them are beginning to like it. A lot of them absolutely adore it. And my grandparents, they built themselves a, a family home, which is very similar to this Kotva building. And I grew up there. Therefore, my friends, they used to call it a mini Kotva. A mini Kotva, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why do the haters hate it? Oh, there are so many reasons. And it's not very, it's not a very black and white situation. A lot of it has to do with the time that it's been constructed in. It has to do with people absolutely hating the communist regime, rightfully so. So the symbolism. Yes. And it's quite difficult to explain. You know, it was built during the communist regime, but, you know, the 60s were kind of a different time and it was possible to build something Western-like and basically anti-communist. So it's kind of difficult to say that it's a communist building. So it's a lot of explaining to do regarding a building built uh, during the communist era. So that's one main reason people don't like the building. But some people do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, A lot of them do. But a lot it's of them. Still a minority. Yeah. Uh, For and, example, I do. <laughs> <laughs> the second reason, just to be very brief about it, is as I mentioned earlier, it's built in the historical city center. So Czechs aren't very good with kind of accepting the contrast and like yeah. Americans. Yeah. <laughs> so that just shortens it. They just don't like, you know, they call it a monstrosity and in the middle of the picturesque city center. So um, that's the second main issue. Now, Haruna, you traveled around Europe Mm -hmm. photographing buildings for your film, Built to Last. Where did you travel? Uh, Actually, I traveled uh, many ex-communist countries, and I was focusing on like the 1945 till 1989 architecture. Of course, I included well, ex-Czechoslovakia as well. And I filmed the Hotel Thermal and Kotva building, the shopping mall of Marie's grandparents. Uh, I captured them in my film as well, among others. But besides that, I travel to Moscow, where everyone got inspired uh, at the first place. I traveled to Berlin, Warsaw, Budapest, Bucharest, Belgrade, Pristina, Tirana and Sofia, so all the capital cities of the Eastern Bloc. And it was like a four-year journey. I I worked on that film quite slow, always when I had a little bit of time to travel, which was possible back then. Now, of course, it's much more challenging to make movies abroad because of the pandemic. And it was a super interesting experience because I could meet and talk to local architects and urbanists who were in every country, sort of my guides. And I made a lot of research. I digged into film archives, photographic archives, where I spent like two months like digging into them in Budapest. So yeah, it was a long journey. And At the end, after four years, only like one hour film was done, which then like traveled to various festivals around the world. And it got quite a good feedback and it opened up some discussion, what Marie mentioned before, that it's very difficult to accept this architecture because people are still very narrow-minded and they label 
everything which was built during communism as something which is not good, that we should demolish and build some new buildings instead of them. But of course, it's not so easy to talk about it because I was covering like this quite a long period, like the 50 years of the architecture development at the time. So of course, like you, you start with this socialist kind of architecture, then what Murray was mentioning, the 60s, this very like modern architecture, and then it evolved even more into like very, very modernist and this brutalist architecture. So it's not so black and white and yes. we can't just say it's all like this communist, uh, dark and ugly architecture because that's not true. So Marie, how do you help people separate architecture from communism when thinking about these buildings? Well. I mean, it's been a learning curve, uh, I have to admit that, because we started our project kind of spontaneously. And uh, what we learned very quickly is when you're born after the revolution and you try to tell people that buildings built before the revolutions are fine, it doesn't go well with a lot of them. Um, And when you say the revolution, are you talking about in 1989 or 1917? Yes, sorry. Okay. So... Uh, 1989 is when the communist era in Czechoslovakia, or, well, basically in the whole of the East, came down. And I'm born in 92. Okay. So to the generation of my parents and people a little bit younger than them, I am this, you know, spoiled post-revolution brat that never lived through communism. Um, we call those and, millennials you know, over here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For a lot of people, you know, I they thought I didn't know what I was talking about. And I did have to do a lot of studying. However, what I've learned is that to explain the buildings to the general public, I need to use the story of my grandparents, which is more personal and kind of more relatable. And it's easier to to kind of get my point across through that story rather than you know, explaining sure. how they were, you know, influenced by Western architecture in the 60s and how that was politically possible. It, that's too complicated. So I use my grandparents' story to do that. Aruna, since we're a podcast, we can't show slides of the buildings. Mm-hmm. But tell us about some of the more spectacular buildings that you found making your film. Well, there are just so many of them, but um, to start with, the whole project started in Bucharest. Like, that's where I traveled for the first time. And I was just amazed by the Ceausescu Palace, which is, after Pentagon, it's the biggest administrative building in the world. Wow. And it's just mind-blowing. In a way, it's monstrous, it's spectacular. Ceausescu was the communist leader in Romania, Romania, which was executed in uh, December 1989, and also his wife. I mean, the building as such is, it's not like uh, modernist architecture. It's built in a very classical style. And when you enter, you see like, You're in a monstrous golden palace with uh, millions of rooms and corridors. So I was then like starting to research what the heck was going on in Romania. Like, how is it possible that this poor country was able to build such a building and Of course, it was like back then it was crazy time because Romania was so poor. The leader, Ceausescu, he demolished old villages and he was building like all across country block houses. And when you travel around Romania now, so you see these same looking block of houses everywhere instead of the picturesque villages which were there. So it's not to adore the style or the regime that he brought, but 
it shows the site that everyone imagine when we talk about the communist era architecture. But then when I travel furthermore, I, I've seen amazing buildings such as in Kosovo, in Pristina, the National Library. It's a super modern, brutalist kind of library with a very special design. In Bulgaria, the ex-communist headquarters, which was built a one-hour drive from Sofia, called Buzluja, which kind of became the main theme for my film, but also it uh, became this kind of pilgrimage point for many people who are interested in this architecture from this era. Is this the building that has the tower and the saucer-shaped yeah, it's building in Bulgaria. It's this kind of UFO shape building built in the middle of mountains in the middle of nowhere. And it's abandoned. And it's abandoned. And now they are discussing what they're going to do with this building. So there there are a couple of plans, such as like a luxurious hotel or Museum of Communism or some casino. Like that that was like <laughs> a few years ago when I was there. They they were it would uh, make a great I, casino yeah <laughs> which is not exactly what the original builders <laughs> intended uh no marie where does the name of your nonprofit respect madam come from um so as i mentioned earlier it's only my grandmother that's still alive and um i started the nonprofit with my older brother and throughout the years also my younger brother joined in it's a very much a uh, family business or project rather it's not a business. We very spontaneously reacted to some political issues that were going on with Hotel Thermal, the building uh, that we're mainly focusing on. I don't really want to bore you with the details, but basically the hotel is owned by the state and the state is currently run by a very populist government. So as you can imagine from your own experience, uh, it's not the, they don't do the best decisions, especially mm. regarding post-war architecture. That's not really their area of expertise. So they made some terrible decisions. They were talking about tearing down a part of the building or maybe selling it off, making it into a casino. Uh, that's why it really made me laugh <laughs> when Herna was talking about that casino. It really proves that the governments, they really don't know what to do with right. those buildings. We used to have a casino operator as our president. Yes, yeah. we did. Yeah. Yeah. We sure so did. maybe it's a trend. I hope not. So we reacted to this situation and basically our what we were trying to put across is to say, look, respect my grandmother's work. Um, ah, but that came from a specific event involving um, spray paint, didn't it? Yes. So the building where I grew up, the mini Katwa we were talking about earlier, among architecture enthusiasts, uh, it's a rather well-known building because it's covered in this mystery. My grandmother, she's very private. She never allowed anyone to, you know, take pictures of the building or kind of see it inside. So very often growing up in this building, there would be people kind of peeking across the, the wall and the fence. And <laughs> it took me a while to realize that it's architecture enthusiasts and not, you know, crazy people <laughs> trying to burglar us. There is a difference. Yes. Yes. But it took me a couple of years to figure that out. And uh, one day some uh, there was a spray painted stencil, like a graffiti on the wall next to the entrance to the garden, which surrounds the building, that showed Hotel Thermal, and it said, respect, madame. And we blatantly stole that and used it as our name. And uh, what I like about it the most is up until that point, my grandmother was very diligent with removing graffiti from that particular wall. Uh, and since then, she just let it be because she saw that then in her 80s that it's some sort of an art form as well, graffiti. And she saw she some graffiti, yes. Yeah. She saw some that she liked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it did show her building, and it's a nice graffiti as That's well. That's cool. Now, Marie, did your grandmother continue her architecture career after your grandfather died? No. I mean, not really. It has to do with the the change of the regimes. 
So the 90s, which is the first decade after the revolution when communism fell apart, was an era when basically everyone said everything that happened before the revolution was 100% wrong. Was bad. And now yeah. everything that we do now is 100% right. So not only my grandmother's partner in crime and in everything died in the first month of democracy, so she stayed alone for the studio, but also she wasn't accepted by the new generations immediately because they considered her a communist architect, which is kind of paradoxical because after the Russian invasion of 68, she wasn't allowed to make buildings. Okay. So she she was forbidden from working during communism and then, I mean, to an extent, and then she was considered a communist architect for quite a while and wasn't really given a chance to build more buildings. And it's only now in the past, I would say, 10 years that people have stopped looking at the communist era in such black and white manner. And they're kind of more capable of seeing the nuances that, uh, of course, happened during the era. Now, Haruna, you have a sequel to Built to Last, a Built to Last Beijing. Mm-hmm. Oh, what was that all like? Um, the story goes that I, I spent some time in China, which was after the release of this film. And I just decided, because I was in Beijing, and of course, it's all communist architecture there because the old hutungs and all of that smashed already, like the the Mao Zedong built Beijing from scratch from the 1950s. So it's all there, basically. And it's so interesting to see in China how they took the Russian style, but they are mixing it with the Chinese pagoda and you know, the old Chinese architecture style. So it's kind of weird mixture, you know, see these communist style buildings mixed with Chinese characters, but uh, as well, it has very characteristic statues and paintings and mosaics, which we are used to see in um, Eastern Europe. So it was quite inspiring as well, like to get to see how Asians took their inspiration from Russia and how they made it into their own quite specific style. But of course, because China is still a communist country, we can't really talk about modernist architecture there. It's just not there at all. Let me ask you a question to each of you as we wrap up. In America, we think of communist modern architectures being very bland and very gray. Is that actually true, or is it better or or worse or more or less functional than some of the buildings that you've seen here in America? Um, there's two things I would like to add to that. The first one being the topic of what we've kind of been mentioning throughout the whole interview, and that is that the term communist architecture is really quite nonsensical or rather it's very broad and it's kind of saying americans are voting for trump full stop right or to say um, that there is capitalist architecture yes so there's together there's a lot of differences between each countries and between each kind of historical areas and uh, i mean decades etc cetera, etc cetera. Because I know there's this trend of uh, looking at communist architecture and kind of generalizing it and making it about, you know, communist bus stops and things like that. And if I'm to be completely honest, it's kind of infuriating for me uh, when I observe it, how, you know, the Americans tend to talk about communist architecture because it's very generalizing and it doesn't make the architecture look very good if I make it very blunt. That's okay. I think that's a good point. On the other hand, I completely understand it's very difficult to to kind of get yourself oriented within the different histories and eras. So it's completely understandable that this happens. When I was thinking about what I want to say in this interview, this was the one thing that I wanted to really make stand out, that there's so much history within 
those years of the communist regime, that it's just impossible to kind of generalize it into communist architecture. In regards to that, what I feel my grandparents' architecture is like is very much inspired by the West and by Le Corbusier and Alvar Alto and, you know, all the brilliant modernist architects. And lastly, it was one of the most, my grandparents' work at least, but generally communist architecture, I think, is one of the most colorful architecture there is, especially in the 20th century. There, the way they worked with color was, in my opinion, so brave. They used color in places where you wouldn't expect it, such as window frames. For example, my grandma, she put red window frames everywhere. And it's actually became a bit of a problem, for example, in our family house, because it was this very specific shade of red that was made during the 60s. And now it's basically impossible to oh. mix it. Oh. Um, so whenever we need to fix anything on the window frames, we really need to dig deep into, you know, the color, the paint industry to find the exact shade that we need. And yeah, they, she just used so much color. And I think uh, it was the case for most of the architecture at the time. They were just very brave with materials and colors and definitely not kind of gray and blunt and huge. Now, Haruna, what do you see as the, the major differences between American modernism and Eastern European modernism? Yeah, I want to add something. Imagine Czechoslovakia was a locked country so in my point of view, these guys, these architects were so brave and so skilled that they were actually able with a lack of material to sort of improvise and build something modern. This is something that we shouldn't forget that um, the material that they could use at the time was not as good as in the West. And they were very often improvising as well. And uh, they used glass in a very original way later on, for example, in the 1980s. So as Mari said, for me as well, it's not totally gray architecture. Also, because at that time, the government also was supporting to include sculptures in the public space. So we have quite a lot of art pieces still existing up until today, which is not the case of the 21st century that uh, the government would support to, to make the public space look nicer with some art pieces. So of course, like comparing it to the US, it's almost impossible because you guys, you, you were free. You had, uh, in the US, you could get the materials to, to build uh, buildings properly. Right. Not just budgets, but access to building materials and technology. Yeah, exactly. The, all the technology, and no one would judge you if you were building in a modern style, which was totally not the case in this part of the world. May I just add one thing? It's a bit of a thing we started doing with my brother because we found out that it's very difficult to kind of make the architecture remain in a good state. It's difficult. I mean, people usually have different plans whether they make it into casinos and we really are not in a position to save the buildings, turns out. However, we've decided a way how to preserve the idea is to get people's memories about buildings like that. And uh, what I think would be extremely interesting is if Americans came to Czechoslovakia or Eastern Europe and saw these buildings, I would be really glad to hear what they thought uh, with their perspective, which is completely different to ours, obviously. And also, if they specifically have been to Hotel Thermal in Karlovy Vary, that would be absolutely amazing to hear what they think about that because it's a center of a big film festival. So there's a big chance that someone might have been there. That would be great to hear their memories of that. Just one last question for Marie. Surely by now you printed up some Respect Madam t-shirts, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
We printed it some at the very beginning and we haven't since, but we have a lot of plans. We're just kind of making them happen as we go. We do everything out of our pocket and, and uh, you know, in our spare time after work. So uh, we move slowly. Well, if you make one, please let me know so I can order one. <laughs> Haruna, do you have a website people can reach you? I have a Vimeo account uh, where people can watch my other films about architecture. So, yeah. Um, okay. And that is? It's um, vimeo.com slash my name, Haruna Honko. And Marie, what is your website? Well, the website is respectmadame.cz. But we're the most active on Facebook, which is Respect Madame. Unfortunately, everything's in Czech, but we're happy to provide translations and explanations in English to anyone who's interested. And there's a lot of pictures. Okay. And spell respect for our American audience. Oh, yes. Uh, it's the Czech spelling. It's R-E-S-P-E-K-T. K-T. Okay. And when you say C-Z for that's Americans, C-Z. that's C-Z. Yes. Yes. So they teach us British English here. Yes. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> so respectmadam.cz will get you to Marie's site. Thank you both. This has been great. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for having us. Haley Tuck is a jazz singer from Austin, Texas. She's been referred to as this generation's Louise Brooks, which is really two generations ago or so. And her bio reads like it came from a novel in a left bank bookstall in Paris. <laughs> Indeed, at 18, she left her Texas Baptist military boarding school for Paris. That must have been quite an escape move. She spent her days in vintage clothing markets and nights singing in jazz bars. A chance encounter with an Italian countess at 18 led her to singing in palazzos in Venice, late-night costume parties, we're told occasionally scantily clad, and of course underground cabaret venues. Her debut album, Junk, was released in 2018. Her new self-produced EP, Coquette, will be released in March 2021 and explores work, mental health, and the unromantic nuts-and-bolts duties of life we all face. Containing both originals and covers, it touches on both her love of the darker side of jazz, accents of dreamy folk pop, while maintaining her playful personality. Welcome, Haley. Thank you. <laughs> so what exactly is a Baptist military boarding school? I mean, do they yeah. like pray with guns? How does it work? Oh, my gosh. I'll tell you what. It's the biggest, greatest scam in all of history is what it is because my dad, my dad went to this school and back when he went, you know, it was, you know, a real honor in, like, blue-collar Texas to go. And so he wanted to con me into going because I would make lifelong friends, allegedly, you know, blah, 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 whatever. And so he told me that it was going to be, like, Hogwarts. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me tell you, it is nothing like Hogwarts. I mean, except for a whole lot of talk about maybe dark magic and Satan. But yeah. um, it is, I mean, it's intense. They called me Private Benjamin, which was this movie with Goldie Hawn where she goes to the army. Right. And it was, I mean, it was, I guess, interesting. It was like a really interesting experience. And I would have hated high school anyway. Um like the other day I was, I was babysitting for my sister and I found, she has all my books and I found my high school diaries from boarding school. And it's saying like, must I die so young <laughs> to go under the cold, wormy ground? You know, so I was doing quite a lot of reading at that point. Of, and writing. And writing clearly, you know, and saying, I'm going to go to Paris one day and, and leave all this behind. And, uh, and so, you know, it was good for that, you know, and it certainly worked. It propelled me forward. And you did. I mean, you made it happen. Did you graduate? I did make it happen. Uh, I did graduate by the the skin of my teeth. I graduated um, and then went to Paris. And was, I bet it was like like the next day, like you got your diploma and you went to the airport. Is that how it went? Oh, yeah. I mean, practically. I had actually crazily been in a burn accident when I was younger. And so I had this 
like, I mean, trust fund is a strong word, but I had this like insurance payout that crazily became mine at 18. And it was in installments that was supposed to be used for college. But obviously I was like, school of hard knocks, here we come. So I could use it how I wanted. So I was able to kind of immediately take myself to Paris. And I lived in this like crazy squat and I didn't know what a squat was at the time. What is Um, a squat? A squat is when like the laws in Europe allow for taking over property, I guess, because like, I mean, people have been in property for so much longer. So there's kind of lax laws. Like you can go into a building. For Mm -hmm. example, my building was a really gorgeous ancient bank in Paris and anarchists and different people had kind of just gone in there. Somebody had left the lights on too long and anarchists came in and just took it over and just as long as somebody's in there 24-7, nobody so, can take you out. Well, we were, we're talking about, say, an abandoned building. And well, it's not abandoned, not in well, any way. In fact, it's by just the bank. like, you know, like it's, maybe it's for sale or maybe they're going to renovate it or maybe they're it's doing empty, something else with it. It's still owned. It's empty. Definitely still owned. And wow. they take it over. And if they stay in there long enough, the government will either rehouse them into like really cool, different housing, or they just stay in there for a really long time. So it is a pretty common practice in Europe. But I had no idea what that meant. So I was pretty scared to arrive in a squat. I was like, what do you mean I can't come in if the police are outside? Um, (laughs) How's your French? Um, it's très bien. Oh, <laughs> excellent. Um, excellent. It's, it's pretty good. I've had a lot of time to practice, a lot of champagne to practice with. So how a lot long, of French how, guys to practice How with. long did you stay in Paris? So, I mean, I still honestly live part of the time in Paris. I stayed in Paris for a couple of years, like right off the bat. And then I, I actually moved home. I came crawling back when I ran out of money for a couple of years. And then I just kind of missed it. I, I came here to kind of cut my teeth a bit more and just do like more of like the miserable seafood restaurant gigs, you know, date the jazz piano player, twice my age, you know, blah, blah, blah sort of game. And then I just really wanted to move back. And then I moved back and kind of lived between London and Paris. And now I live between Portugal and Paris and tour mostly for a living. Well, uh, these all need to be elements in the movie about your life because this is a great <laughs> biopic already. Oh, How yeah. old are you now? I am about to be 31 in April. Yeah. I mean, this is great material for the movie. <laughs> it really is. And an Italian oh, countess and uh, yes. uh, scantily clad costume parties. and <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I okay. know. God, if you could see me now, how the mighty have fallen. I'm sitting here in, like, crusty pajamas with my, like, you could fry an egg in my hair. I've been watching, I've been watching, like, trash TV. (laughs) This first song is called Where Do You Go, which opens with a reference to Marlene Dietrich. Tell us about the song. Yes. Um, Well, actually, it is a cover song that is weirdly, like, not that well-known, or maybe it was just kind of like cheesy. It was kind of this this guy trying to I don't know whether he was trying to be French or or trying to, I don't know, appeal to the French. His name is like Peter Sarsdet, singer songwriter guy. But the lyrics I thought were just like so apropos to my life. It sounds like it's written about me. Um, you talk like Marlena Dietrich, you know, you dance like Zizi Jomer. Uh, I mean, my clothes are definitely not made by Bellman, but it's kind of about like a, just this girl who's, who is trying to project this really beautiful kind of important, cool, wild lifestyle. But on the inside, you know, she's just this kind of regular girl from the middle of nowhere. I, I mean, I don't, I certainly don't think I'm projecting nearly as cool or as amazing uh, as the girl in this song, but well, I certainly. Why don't we listen to it and then decide how you yes. did? <laughs> okay, Here's Haley yeah. Tuck with Where Do You Go? Marlena Dietrich And you dance like Zizi Jamer Your clothes are all made by Bauman And there's diamonds and pearls in your hair You live in a fancy apartment Off the boulevard Saint-Michel 
where you keep your Rolling Stones records and a friend of Sasha Distel. But where do you go to, my lovely, when you're alone in your bed? Tell me the thoughts that surround you. I want to look inside your head. You got from the Sorbonne And the painting you stole from Picasso Your loveliness goes on and on When you go on your summer vacation You go to Jouan Le Pen With your carefully designed topless swimsuit You get an even suntan on your back and on your legs When the snow falls, you're in Samarines With the others of the jet set And you sip your Napoleon brandy But you never get your lips wet No, you don't Where do you go to, my lovely When you're alone in your bed Tell me the thoughts that surround you I want to look inside your head for Christmas and you keep it just for fun for a laugh they say that when you get married it'll be to a millionaire but they don't realize where you came from I wonder if they really care or give a damn I know where you go to my lovely when you're alone your bed I know the thoughts that surround you cause I can look inside your head I love the glamorous detail of the song. Oh, thank you. Um, I actually produced this uh, record with my band, so I appreciate all of these, uh, any compliments on it, like so much more than I do other ones. <laughs> <laughs> it was very well produced. Yes. So, so let's, oh, let's thank you. Oh gosh. Let's go back to our our movie storyline. So you are eighteen. Mm-hmm. You've just moved to Paris. You're mm-hmm. at a house that turns out to be owned by a countess, and you tell her. You want to be a jazz singer. Then what happens? It's actually funnier than that. So I had met a different kind of vintage girl on a bus. She complimented me on my vintage dress. And I was like, how did you know I spoke English? And she's like, no, I don't. I just speak to everybody in English. And she's just this really funny character um, named Erin Mahoney. Anyway, so she, Miss Behaven is her burlesque name. And she uh, invites me out to dinner and she is house sitting for this girl. And I am kind of tired of my squat life, as you might imagine. And she's like, well, you can come stay at this house that I'm house sitting at. So she's throwing a party at this house. And knowing Sorrel, as I do now, the countess in question, um, she does not, she would not like a party being thrown at her house when she's not there. Hmm. She likes to be the thrower of parties, but she can be very funny about things like that. And so she comes home from vacation, like exhausted. And our friend is throwing a party in her house. And so she's like, oh, God, you know, like, fine, screw it. I just have to do this now. So then she, even worse than that, sits down on her velvet couch 
And uh, she's like, hi, you know, whatever. Who are you? And I'm like, hi, you know, whatever. Come here often. You know, she's like, I live here. This is my house. And I was like, ooh, bad news. I'm, I live at your house. She's like, where? I'm like, right here on this couch. And she's like, oh, my God. Tell me about you. What do you do? And I was like, no, I'm 18. I just moved to Paris. I want to be a jazz singer. And she's like, okay, well, then um, I'm going to put you in a costume, and I want you to get up on this table and sing. And if I like your singing, you get to keep living on my couch. Ooh. And so she puts me in this beautiful, like, half-naked Art Deco costume. Um, And back then I had the body for it. And sticks me on her table. And I sung her, I'll be seeing you, um, a la Billie Holiday. Mm. And she was like, that was beautiful. The couch is yours. And I still, to this day, many, many times have slept in the painting studio or her couch. Um, She's still one of my best friends and greatest supporters. She took me to Venice Carnival and... And it's just like she introduced me around so many times. And I think I really, I credit her so much with my life and career because she took what I already had, which was I loved vintage clothes and I loved, you know, like this time period and I wanted to be something. But she actually already was all those things. She's American, but she married an Italian count. And they're both really amazing artists in their own right. And she just said, like, yeah, you can do this. This is actually an option. People do this all the time. Just move to Europe and make it happen. You know, we have friends that are corset makers and miniature portrait painters. And, like, if you want to be a jazz singer, that's an easy one. So don't be afraid of it. So is Meryl Streep going to play her in the movie, Haley? (laughs) Yes. Actually, she should play herself in the movie, to be honest. She sounds like a character. Oh, yes. (laughs) As do you. Yeah. <laughs> you, you never know where life is going to lead you, huh? You don't. You really, really don't. It's so interesting. You know, I wanted to go to Juilliard. I wanted to be an actress. My older sister, who's prettier than me and more on time and just like everything more than me and dates like famous people. I wanted to be her. And I never would have, I kind of like managed to have, she lives in LA and like has this cool life. And like, I never, I managed to carve out my own life. And you know, that's, poetic and cool it is now this next song's lyrics were written by bob dylan in 1962 when palm Mm -hmm. springs was at its height of mid-century modern jazz drawing mostly from the 40s the new and exciting folk movement was taking off back east and bob dylan was right at its center some tight-lipped moralists decried the lyrics of this song for sexual content as the song (laughs) implied people were actually having sex as they might say, without the benefit of marriage. The music is from the public domain song, Who's Gonna Buy Your Chickens When I'm Gone? And the song was used on Mad Men, Friday Night Lights, This Is Us, and Men of a Certain Age, plus movies Dogfight and The Help. Part of innumerable Dylan albums and collections, it's been covered by a huge diversity of performers, including Willie Nelson, Glenn Campbell, Dolly Parton, uh, Trini Lopez, who we lost just last year, Bobby Darin, Cher, Jerry Reed, Joan Baez, the Allman Brothers, my favorite lounge singer, Vonda Shepard, Arlo Guthrie, and other one-name performers like Elvis, Melanie, and Keisha. Uh, the Four Seasons released a cover as a single in 1965 with a fake name, The Wonder Who, which reached number 12 on Billboard's Top 100 and sold one million copies as a fake group. Anyway, the widest acclaim, however, came for folk trio Peter, Paul, and Mary. Until today, here's Haley Tuck with Don't Think Twice. It ain't no use to sit and wonder why If you don't know by now It ain't no use to sit and wonder why It'll never do somehow When your rooster crows at the break of dawn Look out your window and I'll be gone You're the reason I'm traveling on Don't think twice, it's alright And it ain't no use in turning on your light The light I never know It ain't no use turning on your light I'm on the dark side of the road I wish there was something you would do or say 
try to make me change my mind and stay We never did too much talking anyway Don't think twice, it's alright You've never done before It ain't no use calling up my name I can't hear you anymore I'm thinking and wondering walking down the road I once loved a woman, a child, I'm told Gave her my heart, but she wanted my soul Don't think twice, it's all right So long, honey baby Where I'm bound, I can't tell Goodbye's too good a word, babe So I'll just say fare thee well I ain't saying you treated me Body Bob Dylan. Yeah, mm. I know. <laughs> I can see you now, Haley, in an Art Deco dress, singing that song on top of a table somewhere. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hopefully someday you will. I know. We're going to have to figure out a way to get us all together. Yes. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you my um, architecture joke. Oh, please. This is how I pick up architects. Did you hear that Frank Lloyd Wright's kids are trying to change the name of Falling Water? His kids are trying to change the name of Falling Water. To rising mold. Oh, oh, oh I get it. it. That's a deferred maintenance <laughs> I'll show joke. I'll myself the door. <laughs> <laughs> no, you win an A for effort, though. Yeah, that's that, a good one. That was a good one. Well, Haley, what's your website? How can people find out more about you and your music? My website is HaleyTuckMusic.com. I am Haley Tuck on Instagram. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so looking forward to finding out who else is is, um, snuggled up with me on this podcast and continuing to listen to this podcast. I want to be best friends with everybody that you guys ever choose to have on here, including you. Be careful what you wish for, because we'll make that happen. Oh, yes. Okay, perfect. Have a great day, you guys. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by Wendy Robineau and Don Beskin. Tom, get to the chopper! (laughs) Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 8,000 significant modernist houses, and access 3 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Rogue archivist Carrie Cesarino researches houses, architects, and podcast guests while juggling two above-average children, 12 domestic animals, and a shockingly handsome husband, Adam, who knows just how to flip her breakers. Sparks will fly. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild, George, and I'll be back soon with another concrete and steel, brutally modernist edition of U.S. Modernist Radio.